All right. Hey, it is great to see you this morning. We've got lots of people online as well, but those in the room, we're so glad that you're here. What a great day to worship the Lord. I've been gone for a couple of weeks. Some of y'all know about 40 of us were in the, the Holy Land for the past couple of weeks. And I was struck by a lot of things. You'll be sorry. I'll be unpacking it along the way. Um, and throughout the Christmas series, especially, it's going to come into play just to be there where Jesus walked and taught. It was just incredible. But I was struck by this ever-present um, reality of the contested space that that little part of the world is. And it's really small. Like, it's really right close in. And it all, the epicenter of it all is on the Temple Mount. If you've ever been, anybody ever been to the Holy Land? Some of y'all been there? Maybe. Um, the Temple Mount, where the, the ancient temple uh, was, is like, I mean, Muslims... Jews, Christians, all vying for space. And, and it's, it's constant. Like it, you can't get away from it. Like I was teaching on the Southern steps that go up into, go to the temple. Like you talk about being where Jesus was. He would have been there many times and taught there many times. We were, we were doing some teaching there with our group. And along the way, we'd be singing praise at different points along the way after we would, you know, in like garden of Gethsemane or different places. It was amazing. But but constantly, even intermixed with our praise, the calls from the imams to come and pray at the mosque, you know, five times a day. And it was just constant. We were at the Western Wall on Shabbat Eve, which is the time to be there. All the Orthodox Jews are there. We were praying with them. I mean, like hundreds of people. It was incredible. But you talk to anybody who's there, who's been there for any time. And they'll tell you, we were there during the prime minister election, by the way, early on. Um, and not unlike here, real polarized. Everybody's got opinions about how it goes down, whose land it is and why. And you can imagine Palestinian, um, you know, Muslims or Arabs and Jews, Israelis, all vying for space. I mean, millennia long, right? Conflict. And the driving emotion you would imagine is, is anger. It's, it's bitterness. It's, you know, all, I mean, just again, generation upon generation, still, you know, rockets being, being, uh, being sent into that region over and over again. Uh, and, and it puts our, it puts us in context, you know, here, our perspective, it, it does that for me. But this past week, of course, was an election week um, that highlights what some have called in our culture, even anger culture. Research shows that we are ang more angry than we were, angrier than we were a generation ago, or angrier than we were a few years ago. And today we're going to talk about anger, okay? But because often politics kind of creates a lot of anger in our society these days, I want to say this as we dive in. This is a word for some of us here, but I, as your pastor, I want to say this. Regardless of how you voted this past week, regardless of how you vote, you are welcome here. Because our identity is not found in partisan politics. It's found in Jesus Christ. And he transcends every leader. Leaders, political leaders, they're voted on, they come and go. Now remind, I was reminded again, right, in the Holy Land. Herod, uh, Pilate, Augustus, Caesar, the Caesars. People aren't coming from all over the world to see those guys. They're coming there because... <laughs> Jesus Christ out of Nazareth ends up in the Sea of Galilee, that whole region in the north of Galilee. He ends up coming to Jerusalem, ultimately dying on a cross for our sin. Our identity is not found in a political party. It's why you're not going to hear me talking about partisan politics. We don't do that. You're not going to see me endorse the candidate because the one that we endorse has already been elected. Um, he's king. He's the king of kings, and he transcends every other political leader that will come and go, any leader that comes down the pike. And our identity is found in him. We're united in him. And that's why our lives, we serve a, a different kingdom. And we pray for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. We do talk about, in all domains of culture, how to engage people, whether it be politics or whatever else. We're going to talk about that today, about how do we manage anger in the world, in our real relationships. But we're not defined by, you know, we're not, we don't identify with an elephant or a donkey. We're defined by the lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. He's the one who unites us. 
And he is the one we worship above all else. So regardless of how it went down for you this week, we can all say, you know what? Jesus is Lord of my life. And even those who, yeah, who are elected, they have term limits. Your family, your friends don't have term limits. And Jesus Christ is, his kingdom is forever and ever. So I just needed to say that to us as we get started here. But here's what I want us to talk about. Anger. We're going to talk about what it is to, you know, to, to, to manage our anger. And, and we all, let's all admit that we have a little bit rest with anger a little bit more than we realize. I think it's going to come, come clean here today for, for a lot of us. But I want you to turn to Proverbs. Proverbs 4. Let's do that. Well, I'm going to be in a lot of different Proverbs today, but we're going to be in Proverbs 4 initially. And then I'm going to really say a lot. I mean, I mean offer a lot of Proverbs. You don't have to turn to all of them. But um, man, if we don't get a grip on this thing of anger, um, we know that it can, we can reap some really, really um, serious consequences. I mean, therapist offices, I talked to a, I talked to a couple of our doctors after the early service, um, doctor's offices, uh, pastor's offices, prisons are filled with people who could not control their anger. And what happens is oftentimes anger gets a grip on us. The scriptures say it's like a fire can ambush us and we don't realize until it's too late and the damage has been done. So how do we control our tempers when it seems there's so much that we could be angry about? And what we're going to see in the Proverbs is um, when every verse, almost every verse, I was struck by this, you read in Proverbs that has to do with anger, it, it says something about the body. And here's why. A couple of reasons. One, our bodies actually change when we get angry. Um, and, and we get, we get frustrated or, or anxious about things. Our bodies literally change because we're integrated, holistic people. We are embodied humans. It's why we worship God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so today what we're going to see, the way that we control our anger is, is, is we've got to control our thoughts. We've got to control our words and we have to control our actions. Okay. So that's how we're going to break this down. And, and what we're going to see is that we really can control our anger and live a different way. Now, here's what's interesting. In Hebrew, um, the word literally, the word for anger means, um, is the same word, root word for nose. And it, and it says, it like points along the way that someone's angry, they're, they're red nosed. I think it has to do with nostrils and we flaring our nostrils. I don't know if you flare your nostrils when you get angry, but it's like, you know, it's, it's just this, you get this red nose. In fact, patience in Hebrew on the other side of that is, um, is long breath is, the, is literally what it means. And we do that too, don't we? Like, okay, just take a deep breath. Calm, calm down, calm down. Patience, because it involves the body. This is really, you're going to see this today. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is our thoughts, okay? Our thoughts. We all know that thoughts lead to actions, okay? That's not a new thing. Maybe you've heard it said that, that um, you sow a thought, you reap an action, and then we're gonna hear today that action really is words, as we heard a lot of people with our anger. Um, reap, uh, reap um, or, or sow, sow a word or, 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 or action, you reap uh, a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character, you sow a character, you reap a lifetime, a destiny is, is the quote. And, and we all know this is true. But before we dive into this, I want us to, um, or as we dive in, I want you to understand this. In, in the Proverbs, and really throughout the Bible, life is described as a pathway, okay? And what we see often in the Proverbs is that you're going to choose the path of righteousness or you're going to choose the path of unrighteousness, the path of wickedness, okay? So Proverbs 4.14, for instance, says this, do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. We, we choose to walk a path, and here's the thing, either of righteousness or wickedness. And, and life is described this way because a path always leads you somewhere. It always takes you somewhere. Every step you take, every thought you have leads to a decision that guides you down a path. Life is a path because it always takes you somewhere. And your thoughts, right, always guide you on a trajectory of life, And this is how we see this. But anger trips us up, takes us off the path really quickly. Now, here's a great uh, couple of verses that'll help set the stage for us. The path of righteousness. I love this. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun. Maybe you've heard this before. Shining ever brighter till the, till the full light of day. 
But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Okay, watch this. The Bible teaches us that the way of love uh, and the way of selfishness are two very different paths that take you to a different end. But they're also different along the way. Did you catch that? The way of righteousness, we'd call the way of Jesus, actually gets brighter as you go. Stacy and I were walking on a sidewalk recently at night, and it was um, kind of this little shopping area, restaurant thing. And as we walked, we didn't know it, but then it had motion sensing lights. So as you walked, it lit up. Oh, wow, check this out, you know. And, and it, but that's what's described, it's described here. But it gets brighter as you go. And in fact, 1 Peter 3, 18, as we grow in grace, Peter says, we start to, we, our, our lives come alive and we, we, we walk in the light. And, and what's happening here in this chapter, uh, Proverbs 4, darkness is, don't miss this, is, is self-deception. It gets darker and darker as you go. But in Christ, here's what happens. It gets brighter and brighter because as we grow in grace, God's love for us, we start to see things about God and things about ourselves that we were denying, that we were unaware of. And here's the beauty. As we walk in grace, come to understand how much we're loved in him, we can finally be honest about things that we were denying. That's the beauty of growing in grace. And it's how we grow. And this is, and I'm saying all this because anger is like this. See, a lot of us would say, I'm, I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. Right? I'm not angry. Here's, here's how it goes. I'm, I'm, I'm just right. <laughs> and we might not be. And this is where we get into trouble in our marriages, in relationships. We, and we all do it. And I want you to think about character trait. And today we're focused on anger, but, but this, this, this applies to, I'm not, I'm not proud, I'm just confident. I'm not abrasive, I'm just direct is what I am. No, no, you're angry and you're not very nice, really. I mean, that's, that's more like it. And yet we rationalize. That's self-deception. That's this darkened path that, that we find ourselves in. And the sin, here it is, the sin that's most distorting your life right now is sin that you cannot see. Because we, we're self-deceived. So you say, well, Jeff, how would I know? How do I get out of that? Ask someone. And someone really close to you. Maybe that's an application. How am I doing here? How am I doing because we're all, all deceived. It's why key and deep relationships are so important in our lives. But think about it. What makes you angry? When, when are you likely to be angry? And here's the key question that we've got to really think deeply about. Why am I angry? Really? Why do I get angry? What does my anger reveal about where I place my trust? What are you afraid of losing? That's what it comes down to. And so as we think about this, I want, I want you to think about how, how you know, what influences um, are coming into your mind and into your, what, what do you allow into your head, in your thoughts that, that stir up anger within you? Proverbs 22, 24 and 25 says this, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. See, often thoughts of anger are stirred up by people around us or by people that we allow into our heads. And if you don't have angry people in your life, um, news channels are quick to provide those people for you. <laughs> you know this, right? Yo, we've got to be discerning. Because what happens is we get sucked into the world and we find Christians acting like people in the world. Well, because we're right. No, you're, you're a jerk. I mean, really, you're not helping the cause at all. We're listening to people who are angry. And then what happens is that can stir us up. Be, be wise, be discerning. Whatever you put in your mind is going to come out in your life, right? So it starts with our thoughts. Then it goes to our words because our words are what often hurt people the most. Jesus said, out of the, out of the mouth, the heart will speak. Whatever's in our hearts, our minds comes out. So when we deal with angry people, 
And maybe, maybe you know, you're, we, we do this too, don't we? We're so deceived. This message is really good for my spouse. I'm just glad they're here. I mean, this is good, <laughs> really good. And I know people who are crazy at work. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be tracking and see if I can tell them something about this. Um, but here's, what, here's, here's the real famous one. Proverbs 15.1. It says, um, a gentle answer turns away wrath. I mean, this is powerful. And gentleness and patience are fruit of the Spirit. And, and we can just remain silent at times. How about this? A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. This is a word for some of us. You can overlook offenses. Like you don't have to retaliate you don't have to respond to everything you disagree with. And frankly, confessionally, I've had to learn this. I mean, like as an apologist, preacher type, like that's wrong. Let's call this out. That's messed up. You know, instead of no, I don't have to come at everything that I might disagree with. A man of great wrath, watch this, will pay the penalty for if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. This is saying there's high price if you don't control your anger with your words in particular, um, and it's not easily remedied. And, and so all these Proverbs really kind of share the essence of what the Proverbs say. Don't retaliate anger with anger. We see this throughout the Bible. Gosh, we see it ultimately in Jesus, right? But in James 1, 119, if there's a New Testament book like the Proverbs, probably James. You've heard this before. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Man, if we would just do that. And then it goes on. It says this, for anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And then in chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle the tongue, but deceives his heart, this person, deception, again, this person's religion is worthless. That's powerful. Here's what it's saying. The purity of one's religion is determined by how they respond. I'd say it this way. The purity to any religion on the planet is defined by how the adherents respond to people who disagree with them. And you can see real difference between the religions and how that plays out. And Christians always, we don't always get high marks here, but we should. James goes on to say, you know this, that the tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth, drives the whole animal. He, he says it's like a rudder, little rudder on a giant ship. And then he says in chapter three, so also the tongue is a small member of, of the body, little, yet it boasts of great things. How great, this sounds like a proverb, how great a forest set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Worlds are created by what we say. So here's an application. There'll be many as the Spirit speaks to you. This week, here, here's, here's, my, here's my determination. Every word that comes out of my mouth glorifies the Lord, edifies others, and points them to Jesus. Let's commit to that today. My dad used to say, if you don't have anything nice to say, what? Don't say anything at all. It'd be a great That'd be a great way to live, wouldn't it? But I want you to apply this. Who are you prone to hurt with your words? And let's be honest. Most often, it's people who are closest to us. It's people that we should love the most. Maybe we feel just more comfortable around them, more vulnerable. That's no excuse to, to offer words that are hurtful. Spouses should constantly be affirming and loving each other. The world is a hard place to live. We should be blessing each other constantly. And here's another. When we don't, I'm sorry, are powerful words. Parents should, should be guiding their kids with kind words and love. And if you have kids who have siblings, never allow them to say unkind words to each other. And start early and often. That does not happen in our family. We're not going there. We're not doing that. And, and we need to teach our children to, to just love one another with our words because a pattern of hurtful words can really hurt people. Maybe you grew up in a home. Maybe that's your experience where you have been shamed. You've been condemned. 
And hurtful words still, like on repeat, are in your mind. You know, you, you may have Jesus in your heart, but you got granddaddy in your bones. And you may have mom or dad in your head. And some of us have grown up in a way that we feel hurt. And watch this. You've heard it said, hurt people hurt people. Because we've not dealt with self-condemnation that can come out as anger towards ourselves. I talked to one of our young members today. And, he, and he's, he's seeking help because we have counseling. We have help for this kind of thing. Saying, you know, I, I get angry at myself more than anybody. And I need to unpack that. Because it comes out in your life. Maybe that's the case for you. Overcoming angry means you're going to overcome your thoughts. You're going to overcome your words. And you're going to finally overcome your actions. All right? You're over overcoming your actions. Our physical bodies change when we get angry again. But our, our bodies actually change. Look at Proverbs 16, uh, 32. It says, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than, a, than he who takes a city. It's harder to control your anger than it is to be a conqueror of a city. But in Christ, we can remain calm. We can be that non-anxious presence for our friends, our coworkers, and our families. Proverbs 25, 28 says this, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. An angry person is defenseless, like out of control, right? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to Proverbs 29. Okay, we're gonna look at this little passage of scripture to apply it and land this before we're out. Uh, Proverbs 29, beginning with verse 8. I want you to see a progression, okay? It's, it starts out this way in verse 8. Scoffers set a city aflame, but the wise turn away wrath. There it is again, this idea of turning away one who's anger, angry. But scoffers and mockers are ongoing characters in the book of Proverbs. Like you see them over and over again. Bruce Walkie, who's um, the great commentary on the book of Proverbs, he writes this. Mockers and, and scoffers... They inflame a community's latent anger against one another, listen to this, to a boiling point by scoffing at the moral order, distorting the truth, and inciting people's passions through heated rhetoric. Like, we don't see any of that in our culture. I mean, they had trouble back then. Like, that's jacked up. But no, no, be discerning again. Podcasters, politicians, those who snooze types, who stir up. Look at that, distorting the truth, inflicting, inflicting people's passions through, through heated rhetoric. Again, what some people call news, we, news does, facts don't sell. Scoffing and mocking sells. And we've got to be discerning about that. Proverbs 29, 9, look at this next verse. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs and there is no quiet. Sometimes, some people aren't worth arguing with. I've had to learn this, but here's what I've done. Here's what I'll do. Somebody will come at me with something, and it might just be a question. I've had to discern that too. Like, that's, you're coming at me, but I think you're just asking a question. But wow, you seem mad. But what happened, well, I'll respond. Here it is. Respond with a gentle, gracious kindness, because that will serve. What, however they respond next will show you, oh, no, you're just coming at me. Like, you don't even want to have a conversation, because now you're just, you continue to come, and I, I, can't, I can't argue with you. Like, you've already made up your mind. You, know, you don't want to talk. So in essence, and I'll be kind, but like, I'm out. I'm out. You don't want to have dialogue. But that's how a gentle answer will help you determine that. And even when you get into real debate or conversations with people, and y'all, Thanksgiving, Christmas is coming, so hang on, um, <laughs> with, with family members. But what's the win? What is the win? If the win is to win an argument, then that's not the way of Jesus. The win, I mean, at times, if you're truly in a, in a, in a kind and loving kind of debate, but, but what's the win? And again, politicians have term limits. Family members don't. And friends do not. We've got to continue to be loving. But if your anger, I've got to say this, if your anger leads to unkind words or unkind actions lead to violence, you need to get help today. And maybe you live with someone and you're a little fearful. I talked to a couple recently and this was the case. You may feel a little fearful with the person you're living with or someone close to you or someone at work. Maybe it's a roommate or a friend. Listen, we want to help you today. I'm not kidding. That needs to end. And we have help. Here at the center, we have 
therapy for people who have uncontrolled anger. And, and we don't want that to continue in a crowd this size. Some of us are wrestling with it. And let's be honest. Because what, what we're seeing here is in our culture, and here's, here's why there's this ambient frustration and anger in our culture. I've seen a shift in our culture. Look, look at this next verse. Uh, verse 10, it says this. Bloodthirsty men hate one who is blameless and seek the life of the upright. Bloodthirsty men are killers and murderers, okay, in, in the Proverbs. Now, this is extreme. This is violent anger. And, and I don't know if you've ever been um, the object of scoffing and mocking as a believer um, because of your faith, maybe at work or school or something. I have been. Um, just recently, I'll, I'll share this story to make the point. I was walking down North Coast Highway. This was a few weeks ago. After church, I was pretty hyped. We had, we baptized a bunch of people. A lot of y'all had brought friends. I met a lot of people. I felt like we exalted the Lord um, with everything we had. I thought it was a great morning. I'm walking out feeling pretty good after church. And I'm, I got my backpack. I'm walking out to my car, but I'm going down uh, Northwest Highway. I hear a car coming this way on Northwest Highway. Um, and I heard this beep, 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 you know, and it happens sometimes like somebody will, it'll be a member, you know? And so I was like, who is this? What's going on? And I was smiling and like you, and I stopped and they were driving by kind of slow. There weren't a lot of cars around. They slowed down and this, and the window was down. I thought, who is this? You know, and I'm looking and, um, and in slow motion, guy flips me the bird, like flips me off in slow mo while he's driving by. I'm still smiling, like, what? <laughs> what? What just happened? What is this? Is that a member of our church? Like that? I, it was the sermon that bad? Or, or maybe, no, was it that good? Like, you know, Paul, whenever he preached, he started a riot, you know, and I'm like, I'm in good company. I, but I'm going, what just happened? And I don't know that they knew I was the pastor. Maybe they did. I'm thinking this guy just saw somebody walking out of church. That was his response. I got in my car and I did. I'm not always, you know, I don't want to play the hero. I started praying for that guy. Because what's happened, that's a microcosm. What's happening in our culture is the narrative has been flipped. It's been flipped. And so now people who, uh, who hear the truth oftentimes in our culture, because we, we put God on the shelf and now truth sounds like hate for people who hate the truth. And I, I'm, I'm old enough. Some of you remember this when I was a kid and growing up, well, gosh, it wasn't too many years ago where we're preachers, pastor types and Christians even were, you know, kind of honored, like our good people, people of integrity. And, and now it's, it's, it's moved to not just, we're a little weird. We ought to be weird by the way. Got to be countercultural in the way we love and, 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 and stand, stand for truth. I get that. So it's going to upset some people. But now we're seen as part of the problem. And we, we have shot ourselves in the foot a little bit along the way. But truth sounds like hate for those who hate the truth. And we live now in a culture where this thing about anger and responding and not retaliating, that's the way of Jesus. And we need to get this right. And we need to get it right in our in our little, little world within which we live, okay? And so as we seek to land this, I want us to, to know this. The, um, it all starts in the mind, okay? Comes out in the mouth and can come out in our actions. And what happens, I think what was going on with this guy, didn't know him, Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back, full, full wind, like fuel to the fire. It's how some people live now. And it's progressing more and more all the time. But all of this starts in the heart. I'm praying, Lord, change this guy's heart. Because Proverbs 4.23 says this, keep your heart with all vigilance and from it, for from it flows the springs of life. Everything comes out of the heart, right? And if everything in our lives comes out of the heart, we've got a problem. <laughs> That's the problem. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. A heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick, deceitful, again, self-deceived. Who can understand it? Implying nobody knows how evil the heart is. You have no idea how sinful you really are. 
And I say it often. If you're not the most sinful person you know, you don't know yourself very well. Because all of us, we are more sinful than we can ever imagine and yet more loved than we have ever dreamed at the same time. That's the gospel. And, and, and so the Bible, see, here's the thing. It, the heart is primarily, not primarily, the seat of emotion as the mind is the seat of reason. The heart instead in the Bible, this is worth understanding as we lay in this, is the seat of your deepest trusts. It's the seat of your deepest commitments, your greatest loves. That is what's guiding your life, whatever you love the most. And anger comes when you want something and you cannot get it. That's where the anger creeps in. Self-deception and anger. In a great um, little companion book that I've been walking through, by the way, a great gift item perhaps for you or, or get it. It's a daily devotional by Tim Keller. Um, and it's called God's Wisdom for Navigating Life. It's a, it's a proverb a day. And it's awesome. In it, he says this. He writes this. What the heart most loves and trusts, the mind finds reasonable. The emotions find desirable. And the will finds doable. What he's saying is if you look at something long enough, longingly enough, you'll start to desire it. It'll shape your, your emotions, shape your, 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 your life. It'll capture the imagination of your heart. And like what took place in, 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 in uh, Eden, in the fall, you'll look at it, you'll want it, you'll desire it, and you'll grab it, you'll go after it and take it. And when you don't get it, you'll be angry. Unless your entire orientation of your heart and your mind, you fix your gaze on Jesus, and he's the one you pursue. He's the only idol, the only God that will not let you down, and he is God and Savior. And it all starts when you understand that God's wrath has been taken out on his son. And so what I want us to do is close our time with, with a song together, just back to a song, and praise him as we go, being reminded of this fact. God's, somebody needs to hear this today. God is not mad at you. He's not angry with you. Some of you need to hear this. Self-condemnation needs to end in your life, okay? Because here's what's happening. A lot of us enter into self-condemnation that comes out with anger towards ourselves and that anger towards everybody else. And we don't even realize it. And, and, and what we need to do is understand, here's, overcoming anger starts here. When you realize that the wrath of God was taken out on his son, not, not his uncontrolled anger, methodical, focused wrath, his holy reaction to sin, not taken out on you but taking on his son, Jesus, you've been set free. If you receive that gift of grace in your life, you too can overcome this, this ambient anger and frustration, anxiety that we have in our lives. Listen to this. It was preemptive. Romans 5, verse 8 and 9, it says this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, we have now been justified by his blood much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Praise be to God. There's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So here's what I want us to do. Let's all stand together. And I want us to pray. And we're going to sing our way out uh, before a final word into the week. Okay, friends, what are you going to offer to him? What has he said to you? Your spirit has heard from him. What will you do? Some of you need to come clean today. And some of you need to come to Christ today. By faith, not by your works, what he's already accomplished for you. Come to him now and say, Lord, come into my life. I give you my life. I'm sorry for the way I have turned from you. And I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for taking on the wrath that should have come to me. Thank you, Lord. Your blood continues to heal. It's still reaching. Your love is still reaching out to me, even now, to change my heart today. And we praise you, King Jesus. We love you, and we give you our lives, and we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.